Hello, everyone. We're back for the second Alax session um, of Breakpoint. Uh, you know how Trivago reconstructed the releases uh, by Benjamin Bischoff, test on automation engineer. Um, but without further ado, let's uh, give Benjamin um, a warm welcome uh, in the chat. You know, Benjamin is a test automation engineer at Trivago. He's had you know, wealth comes in with a wealth of experience. You know, as a game developer, um, an application developer, uh, and a trainer. Um, you know, after that, he sort of shifted uh, and made the career shift changed to test automation, which is quite interesting. Um, Benjamin is also the author and maintainer of two open source projects uh, for Cucumber um, BDD. Um, over the last few years, you know, Trivago's has, Trivago has worked on their, their core QA processes and sort of the technologies, uh, and sort of the technologies. Um, and Benjamin will show us how they refine this process, overcome some of the technical challenges, um, as well as some of the adaptive uh, challenges of moving team to a new way of doing things. Um, Benjamin will talk about these changes, the role that end to end test automation plays and um, this, the stack they use. Um, with that, uh, I'll let Benjamin come on and tell us more. Over to you, Benjamin. Hello, thanks. Thanks, Jay. And hello, everyone. So yeah, let's get started there. There is a lot of stuff to cover. I hope it won't be too boring. <laughs> So I thought we would go through those points, uh, tell you a little bit about Trivago and one or two sentences about me, and then talk about the road we took towards continuous delivery. We're still not there yet, but we are in a good way. Then dive into the testing processes and technologies we use, and then give you a little summary of some points, some learnings that I made along the way and the team made along the way. So about Trivago and me, let's get me out of the way first. I'm Benjamin, a test automation engineer at Trivago. I've been working there for the past four years. Before that, I uh, used to be in gaming, uh, game development, and also tools development for games uh, at Ubisoft Germany for six years. And during this time, I got in touch with uh, various ways of software testing and especially end-to-end -end UI based testing using Selenium and also the collaboration and appreciation of QA teams and why they're needed, why it cannot be done without them. So after this experience, I, I fell in love with software testing and decided to take this as the next step in my career at Trivago. Uh, let's see, about Trivago. In case you don't know Trivago, it was founded in 2005 uh, in Dusseldorf, Germany, where its current headquarters is as well. It was the first German hotel meta search. I will tell you a little bit more about what that is. And uh, Trivago has a little over 1,000 employees. So this is what our main product does. Uh, so you can enter a hotel or destination, search for it, apply some filters about uh, details you want from that accommodation or hotel. And then we will forward this request to online travel agencies, independent hotels or hotel chains to find hotels that suit your needs in the time frame you need and then present those results to you so you can make a booking. Um, we have about 3 million hotels and alternative accommodations like Airbnbs, um, 250 plus booking sites we are searching through. We are active in more than 190 countries on 54 different platforms in 33 languages, which makes it challenging to test. And also interesting is that all our different platforms and languages are from one single repository. So we don't have different versions of those sites for different languages. Yeah, and you can apply more than 100 filters to your searches. This is uh, what the website looks. Currently, 
uh, it's subject to change. We're actually releasing a lot daily. So you can probably imagine that this is also another challenge on top of it to test this thing because every single component can change any time. So um, the road towards continuous delivery. We had a uh, development and release process that consisted of feature development by developers. Then there was a lot of manual testing for uh, those specific feature branches. And after the merges, there was uh, some automated tests in place. But you can probably spot uh, what's wrong with this because the testing is missing a lot. I mean, we have the manual tests, but there are some problems with this. There is uh, repetitive manual work because the manual testing had to be done over and over. Old features could break uh, when the new features were merged. Um, the release cycles could be super long for a developer when you would develop something and then wait two weeks until the feature is live. Uh, rollbacks were happening frequently because features um, that worked on their own when they were merged with other features would break. And the automated tests did not have any real effect because they were running so late in the process. Also, the old test automation uh, had some issues. The old framework that we were using, uh, an open source framework that is still around, I won't mention any names, it was not flexible enough for us. We didn't have clear guidelines for tests, um, no full test suite. Uh, we had small test suites that were scattered among the teams. Also, when the uh, tests were running, we didn't have clear results and we lost visibility on those. And most importantly, we didn't have test ownership. So our target process was this, that we would have testing in every stage of the development, like during the feature development, right after the commit, right before the merge and right uh, before the release and after the release as well. So the advantages of having testing in any stage is uh, we have way more stable new features. The old features cannot break that easily because they are also continually tested. We have faster feedback loops for the developers because the tests are running earlier. So the developers don't only know at the end of the process that something is breaking. That makes the release cycles much quicker, the refactoring, of course, much easier. And we cover the critical path, so the money-making path for, for us. So it was decided when I joined uh, a few weeks before to form a central test automation team uh, with some competencies like maintain uh, a test framework and pipelines, support all the teams using our platforms, remove repetitive work from QA, and improve overall stability. This sounds good, but I will show you that this approach had some issues as well. We, as the test automation team, had to make some decisions. We wanted to decide who writes the end-to-end -end tests. And I'm uh, specifically, specifically talking about the end-to-end -end tests because this is a browser stack conference. So we said QA does. QA writes and owns the end-to-end -end tests because they have the big picture. They know what is important for the users. We defined clear test guidelines, um, also enforced by linters, as mentioned in, in the talk before. We said the test code must be located in the repository of the software under test, because when somebody checks out the code for the uh, web application that we're testing, they should have all the tests that go with it. 
and we wanted to centralize the test run within our build pipelines. Uh, it's still possible to run the tests locally or on demand, but they are an integral part of the build pipelines. That's the thing, we forgot the why. So um, we had all of this in place, but we never really said why we want to do it. That led to some interesting quotes, like automated tests are there to replace all manual testing. They want to turn QA into developers. And later in the process, when uh, somebody from QA finished writing a test, he said, my test is done, now I have nothing else to do. And the classic, I have no time for automation because I have so much time to spend with manual testing. And this was our fault because we did not make those points clear in the first place. This is what I call the triangle of doom. We had the developers, the QA team, and the new test automation team. And what happened was this. So we were disconnected from the QA team. We were disconnected from the developers. And QA and developers, they were getting along just fine. So we learned the hard way. Everyone has to be on the same page and testing is a team effort. So all of the involved parties have to know why we want to do it and understand why this is beneficial. Um, so this automation team does not exist anymore. I still do more or less the same job as before, but I'm part of QA now. So we only have the developer QA connection. This makes it much, much easier to know what QA needs and to communicate with developers. And um, uh, this way I'm, I'm part of the whole process much better than before because I now understand the people working with our application much better. So the testing processes and technologies, that is probably going to be the, the largest part of it because, uh, yeah, like, like was mentioned, I am still a developer. So let's see. Um, first, a little bit about the test automation process that we defined. QA is responsible for the test case definition implementation and maintenance. This is important because like I said, the QAs, because they're so close to the users and they understand the user experience and the problems with the application, they are able to define very good end-to-end -end test cases. Um, the review and approval of edit and change tests is also a, uh, a responsibility for QA and also for the diffs. And the review of overnight runs. We have uh, overnight test runs in place that loop over all the test scenarios we have uh, continuously from night till morning. And we have those available as a dashboard. And every morning, one, uh, we call them duty managers from QA, looks at those results and communicates with the involved parties what went wrong and why. The application testability is another responsibility for QA. This was uh, one of the newest additions. So QA has the power to introduce uh, special attributes in the code that makes it easier to test, much easier than um, than using XPath or CSS uh, selectors. And also this is uh, very interesting. I think I haven't seen this before in any other company that QA is responsible for the releases. And that is quite literal. 
they do press the button in the pipeline to release because they know when something is sufficient for release. Our test framework, um, because the old one had problems, uh, originated when I joined. Um, I started this project and it's still in development and maintenance and it's being used right now. It's called Troopy. It's a pure Java framework that I started in 2016. And it's using the latest Cucumber BDD and Selenium versions available. Um, we're actually using the Selenium 4 Alpha build at the moment in the framework. Uh, it supports browser OS combinations and also devices. Um, it's, it's not an Appium framework, so it's strictly for websites, but we can test on mobile devices with it. And it has a plugin API for custom functionality. Um, so if we want to integrate a commercial test grid like browser stack, we just write a quick plugin for it and be done. So this is uh, as an overview how our tests are set up. So I will walk through each of the three uh, steps. This is a test scenario uh, written in Gherkin, that is Cucumber's uh, BDD language. So this could look like this. Um, I deliberately kept those scenarios really simple. In reality, they are, some of them are this simple, but some of them are quite complex with way more steps. It always depends on what you want to test. And uh, in this case, I just check if uh, when I search for Africa or for Berlin, I get some search results. So this is, uh, we, we chose Gherkin because this is super readable for everyone. You don't have to be a developer to understand what we are testing and what we are expecting and asserting. Those scenarios are, are connected to glue code, which is essentially the implementations of those steps. And Cucumber makes it really easy, easy to work with this because of this yellow marked line. This is a, a Cucumber expression, which matches the step that is defined in the scenario. So when I search for Africa or Berlin, this is automatically added as a variable in the test code in the method. And then you can use it um, in the line. Let's see if I can show you. Hope you see the laser pointer thing. In this line, you have the search string that was passed to the method through this cucumber expression. And this is something um, that is might be a little uncommon to do this way because we have the page, then we have a component, and on the component we have a method. Usually you have something like page components or, or page objects, sorry. You have page objects, so classes in uh, your test that represent a, a whole page and access all the functionalities of this page. But since our site is so complex and consists of a lot of components on a page, we decided to go with page components. So wrap this functionality in even smaller parts and just use the page to access those components. This is how this looks. This is how such a component looks, which is annotated with component. So we have a search with search string method on the component that again gets the search string that was passed uh, from the glue code from the step. And then we just uh, send this to the search input of the website and click the search button. So relatively straightforward. And uh, actually, 
pretty much all of our QA team is able to write those tests by now. And this is an example for um, application testability that QA is also responsible for. This is such a uh, data QA um, thing that they were able to put into the code. So in this case, we search um, for the search form, not by any complex selector, but by a data QA uh, attribute that was put into the code by the QA. And that makes our tests more resilient and easier to understand. We're, us uh, we're using two test grids, one of them, as was mentioned, Browser Stack, which is uh, a commercial solution. Um, we have a rather small number of test sessions avail available that is, of course, dependent on the money you want to spend. But what Browser Stack has is a lot, and I mean a lot of browsers and devices you can use. And we use Browser Stack mainly for testing our web application on mobile devices now. The other grid we use extensive, extensively is uh, in our internal cloud, and it's using Selenoid. Selenoid is a uh, open source solution to spin up uh, browser containers in Docker. And on this internal grid, we have more than 500 available test sessions, but we have a very limited number of browsers. So um, if we want to run all of our tests, which is about 300 different tests, we use this grid. If we want to run specific tests, critical tests on mobile devices, we use browser stack. And this approach has been really valuable for us. To be able to do that, we had to parallelize the test. When we started um, automated testing, we did not use parallelization at all. So our test runs would be 45 minutes to an hour. So I, uh, in an internal hackathon of Trivago, I started writing a Maven plugin, uh, which is called Cucable. This pre-processes the Cucumber test resources and creates single scenarios from the feature files, so very small parts, which makes it possible to parallelize the scenarios. I know that uh, the newer versions of Cucumber can also parallelize themselves, but still we use this solution because it's still more flexible for us than um, the Cucumber internal solution. This is uh, just an example. What happens here, we have a test feature which has two examples, um, which would essentially mean this is two features built into one. So uh, if you say that one of those scenarios takes one minute to run, with two example rows, it would take two minutes. But Cucable slices this into two separate um, test features and creates test runners from a template class. If you are interested, uh, maybe later in the details of it, you can just ping me and I will tell you more about it. But this thing um, has sped up our test suite from almost an hour to three minutes now. To run the test, we use different ways, two different ways. Um, because I am a Java developer, I really like Maven. I still do. I prefer it over Gradle. Um, so it's possible to run the test via Maven or run the test via Makefile. And the Makefile is pretty interesting because um, it can be used on systems that don't have Maven and I will show you another benefit of it. 
So this is how we would run a test in Maven typically. So this is Maven Clean Verify, and this is the part that is needed. We pass the base URL of the tests, so the, the website we want to test. We say, okay, we want to test in Chrome. And then we point it to a feature or a feature directory. And then it just runs those tests. If we want to run multiple in parallel, because this would run in sequence, we just add parallel fork count and a number. If you say five, it would run five of those tests in parallel. This is actually the complete Maven command you could use at the moment. So a lot of different um, things you can specify for your test run which is impossible to memorize. So this would require a ton of documentation, which we actually have, but nobody reads. So we decided to make this available via makefile. And makefiles are um, rather old, like I think from the 70s and um, are used to, to build and run C, C++ applications. But you can also use them to do any custom thing you want. So for running a local test, you say make test local. Every developer uh, has make on their systems anyways. Uh, if you use Mac OS, you do. If you use Linux, you do. If you have Windows, you can use uh, something like SigWin then you would be able to run the make command as well. And you specify the base URL and the browser and the features and the parallel runs uh, all in uppercase, but still it looks lo very similar to the Maven command. But the cool thing here is you can actually specify multiple browsers. So in this case, I want to run on Chrome 75 on Windows 10 and the latest version of Firefox on any operating system that is available. And if you run this, it will still work if you have uh, those browsers on your local system. If you want to run the same thing on browser stack, you just say make test browser stack. You don't have to specify any hub or uh, set browser stack specific options. You just change test local to test browser stack and that runs on browser stack. And we also have that for our internal grid. Um, the nice thing is, and this is um, for browser stack, if we want to test on devices, we just add devices and specify those devices um, like this. In this case, I would test on Google Nexus 5 with uh, Android 5. And this would still um, test in Chrome 75, Windows 10, and Firefox with five parallel runs each. This approach also um, allows setting browser resolutions for desktop, specifying a list of variations to activate, which is uh, rather specific to our web application. So you can force different components to act in a, in a different way, which is essential to test all the different variations we have on the website. You can specify the number of test runs. We use that for doing um, flakiness detection. So you can say run this single test 100 times. And you can filter scenarios. You can configure log labels for our central logging and dashboards. And you can specify rerun rules. This is also something that we implemented. So you can specify rules. Um, and when they match a failure in a test, the tests are automatically rerun. So this way we uh, circumvent failures that are environment specific. 
in our CI pipelines, um, the testing is part of it. There are actually way more jobs now with the Troopy uh, prefix in it. We have the release pipeline where Troopy tests are running. We have the continuous live testing, which is um, running day and night against our live instances. So we use that as a monitoring too. Overnight flakiness detection. This is the one that uh, the QA duty managers check every morning and test qualifications. So when there is a new test added, uh, we run a qualification 100 times. So we can spot any flakiness in this new test. This is how it looks uh, in the main pipeline. It's, it's not the complete pipeline, but you can see the, the troopy steps on the right side. There are actually more now. This is the live monitoring, uh, which runs continuously um, day and night against four different instances in the different data centers we are running. So, um, and we actually found that this monitoring is faster and more accurate than other kinds of monitoring we have in place because our test scenarios test if the website is usable, not if some um, API fails or a server goes down, but if the website is usable. And if it's not usable, it raises an alert. The pipeline code, the, the whole um, continuous integration pipelines, this is all in the application repository. And all of those jobs can be changed without um, without touching any separate repository or going through separate reviews. And changes to those uh, jobs are automatically tested because they run through the same pipeline with the Troopy tests in place. For test reporting, we use Cucumber, uh, the second one of my open source projects for uh, Cucumber test reporting. And this um, I started also in a, an, an internal hackathon because we were not satisfied um, with our reporting solution we had in place then because it was just too overwhelming. And if you work with those test reports all day, you want it to be as clear as possible. So we have the failed features, we have the screenshots, stack traces, we have the, the links to the browser stack dashboard, but we also recently embedded the videos of browser stack right in the test report, because that is the most essential part we need from the browser stack dashboard. So right now we can just stay in the report and have everything there. And the reports are stored in their respective uh, CI CD job. So when you go to that job, you always have those reports right there that belong to it. This is uh, how such a report looks. And you can see one failed scenario. And I think you cannot be much clearer than that. There's a failure. If you click on the scenario, you will have all the details and screenshots and videos and whatnot. Also, we have different dashboards in place, like this one is for the overnight flakiness detection. Uh, you will see the little red lines. Those are tests that failed during the night. We have a, a table of failures. And if we have uh, certain failures um, a certain number of times, we look into those and explore. Also, the environment uh, dashboard we have for failures that are uh, environmental, like if some dependency goes down or if, if something in the test grid is not working correctly, we can see that here. And also, we have the test dashboard for the live tests and uh, for the stage 
health and a lot of stuff. So the full test flow uh, looks rather complicated, but I will try to run through it in the uh, last few minutes before I come to the conclusion. So we have the commit of a developer uh, pushing a new branch that triggers our uh, CI CD job. And our build server checks out this branch, uh, this feature branch runs the make file in our test directory because uh, this is possible. We have all the tests and the make file and the job descriptions in the repository. So if we check out this branch, we can directly assume we have the tests there. Those tests are run um, by a bash script that spins up a Docker container uh, with Maven. So this makes it possible to run those tests on systems that don't have Maven. Even locally, you can do that. And then inside this Docker container, um, the Maven test run starts. So it's like running the tests locally via Maven, but running inside a Docker container on the build server. Then we have the Qcable splitting up the features in place so we can parallelize the tests and run the tests on the test grid in different browsers or devices. And after the runs, the results are recorded and uh, Cluecumber generates the test reports. We have the logging of the results to our central log store from which the dashboards are fed. And the reports are stored uh, on the build server. And in the end, we pass or fail the builds. So um, we also have things in place like Slack messaging if something fails. We also attach the screenshots to the Slack messages. I just noticed we have a lot of notifications and dashboards and monitoring. <laughs> so I would like to spend the last three minutes um, with a summary of some important points that I wanted to mention and drive home here. One is make your test automation user-friendly. It seems to be forgotten quite a lot. Um, we also did when we started this central test automation team that we actually have customers and those customers come from the QA team. So working directly with QA changes this a lot because you, you hear the complaints, you hear, okay, I, I would like to have this feature. I would like to have this in the report more clear. And you can act um, directly. And you don't develop a, a test framework like into the blue and then hope that somebody uses it. The thing I learned is test automation is just a tool for exploration. Um, like was mentioned in the talk before, test automation is not the end. Test automation is the beginning. It's a safety net, yes, but it's also when it fails a trigger for exploration. I don't really like manual testing uh, as, as a word. I, I prefer exploration because it's so much more than just manual following of test steps. Because if it was just that, we could just automate everything and be done. But it's not. You need the human factor, and test automation is just a tool. Never stop learning. Super important for everyone in, in the teams. Um, for me, uh, since joining QA, I have learned so much about QA. I appreciate QA even more. I see why it's necessary. I changed my view of test automation as the end. Um, yeah, never stop learning. Also learn about different things. Don't only learn about 
exploration or test methodologies or frameworks. No, learn learn whatever you want because everything is part of your exploration. This is key. Communication is the key. When we didn't communicate, we had this triangle of doom. We had this separation of the teams even more than before. And this is such an important point that I need to mention it three more times. Why not? Communication is key. And on this note, I'd like to end this and thank you a lot for having me here. Thanks to BrowserStack. And if you want to connect with me on Twitter, you can do so at bischoffdev or check out my blog at softwaretester.blog. And on there, you will also find the links to the open source projects. Thanks, Benjamin. Um, I appreciate you coming on board. I think that was that was a great talk. Some some really good chats and uh, questions uh, coming in. Uh, you know, loved how you sort of broke everything down. Um, very well structured and sort of sharing some of the details right around your setup. Um, you. Yeah, folks, we'll be we'll be sharing some of these slides. I think there were a few questions around that, you know, so you can dig in further. I definitely will be playing some of these. You know, on pause and playback. Uh, just to dig in further. Um, and to your point about, you know, everything's sort of part of, uh, you know, keep on learning. Everything's part of your exploration. Um, so yeah, awesome. We can take questions uh, with that. Um, so we have a bunch of questions. Uh, we can sort of start uh, a bunch of questions around the transition. Um, um, so one question is how, how would you recommend beginning a shift away from the triangle of doom? <laughs> Uh, communication. So make sure before you start, don't don't make the same mistake that we made. Make sure before you start, you talk with the involved parties and the involved teams. Um, and also to management. In, in our case, it was really nice that we had management on board right away. Mm -hmm. But we forgot uh, communication with the teams. Yeah. So that's where all this uh, bias came from. And uh, we also had bias. I mean, we, we also said, yeah, hmm, we, we are doing the cool stuff and then everybody has to use it. And, and we felt like on this high horse <laughs> before we realized, okay, it's not about us, it's about QA and the developers mm -hmm. and quality. So we are part of that. We're not like hovering above all that and dictating what has to be done. So mm -hmm. talk, that's that's the lesson I learned. Yeah, that's a fantastic lesson. Um, we have a question around sort of moving, you know, sort of aligning the team and sort of moving them to the new setup. I think you'd mentioned you had a QA team and Test, test automation team, um, sort of the two bases of, <laughs> of, of the Triangle of Doom, um, or some of the <laughs> skill sets uh, that, 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 that are, are advantageous to sort of making the shift um, towards automation. If you, are, if, like if you are in that QA, like in the QA team where you're doing you know, a lot of manual testing. Um, if, you, if you try, it, first of all, you need to have good technology and easy to use technology to try it. I mean, if, if it takes years to master uh, test automation, I, I also wouldn't try it uh, as, as a QA doing exploration mainly. But if you have people there that can guide you a little bit and you just try to um, take a simple thing that you do over and over, every day mm. and you get bored with it and and s automate it you see the benefit you can concentrate on way more important things and you can be sure if your little feature if your little test you're running over and over every day is automatically run every day and when it's uh, when it matters 
it I think everybody can see the benefit of that because ultimately you want to have a job that's interesting or many mm -hmm. people want. I mean, I, I also know people who want to do the same thing over and over every day for those automation is not the right thing. But if you want to have an interesting job in testing, you need to automate some boring stuff away. Yeah. Good answer. Um, we have a lot more questions. So we have some questions around sort of how you do things. Um, like how long does it typically take um, uh, to test quality at the different sort of gates in your pipeline? How long it takes? So in yeah, terms of time? Uh, so uh, yeah, we, we actually separated our test suite into multiple parts, uh, like um, a small set of tests that should be run on every commit, like mm -hmm. every, every single commit, even if you don't have a pull request ready. So I think we have about 10, 15 tests there that take, I would say about two or th three minutes. Um, and then, I, I, no, I think I actually it takes, it takes uh, less than two minutes. And uh, then QA can decide at which point they want to run the full test suite, which is, uh, Mm -hmm. the larger part of, of it. This takes um, about three to four minutes, but it's, it's, uh, it requires a lot of power because it uh, is parallelized in 50 sessions. So if you run multiple uh, runs of those, you will most likely <laughs> make the CI servers explode. So it this it's also a question of resources but it's it mm -hmm. adds um just a few minutes to the pipeline really and it's i think it's pretty acceptable i mean it of course it's not like unit tests that take milliseconds or, or seconds but uh this is a delay that i think every QA or developer can live with. Yeah. Where do you um, run your user journey tests? Um, sort of how many, like how, how big is that uh, test suite? It's uh, roughly 300 different scenarios. And we have um, a few that, ha uh, that are complete user journeys like uh, searching for a hotel and filtering and then um, clicking to the partner and returning and doing a whole lot of things. And we use those mainly for live testing for this synthetic monitoring that, that I mentioned that's running continuously against our live instances. Are you, are you running those on uh, production? Yes, yes, we're running this on production. We're running this uh, basically at every stage. So you can run them locally during the development and we run them through the staging and pre-production and also production. Yes, we use them for everything. Awesome. Do you uh, run into problems around um, like corrupting the data? Uh, if so, like, are, there, are there any tactics or strategies that you use? Uh, corrupting the data, um, or around not uh, testing live. Uh, it's not really a CRUD application that we have there. It because it we're just searching for data, and we're not uh, manipulating this data, so this is not really a problem for us. In terms of uh, visibility, um, and like dealing with the data. From a BI standpoint, um, we filter this. We filter all the data that is generated uh, by the test runs. So those are not uh, corrupting our internal user analysis. Yeah. Awesome. Um, we have maybe a couple minutes. We're sort of almost on time, but I'll get to a couple questions. Um, so around your synthetic tests, uh, what's an example of 
um, a usable test um, of, of the synthetic test that you can use in the pipeline? Um, yeah, um, like the one I mentioned where a user um, goes to the website, searches for a location, then applies some filters. Well, I want this special type of room for this time frame, and then you get search results and you make sure that search result matches your request. And then you um, simulate a almost a booking, I would say. So it's the most vital parts, the happy path of the application that we want to be usable at least for the user. Um, we have a question around, I think you mentioned you have, you know, work with wide range of sort of languages, I think it was 33 languages. Um, do you access um, um, all of these languages? Like um, for, for every release, do you execute tests? And how do you deal um, with, how do you deal with multi-language support? Yeah, we are not really testing every language. We uh, test the English locales mainly with automation um, because we have in each data center around the world, we have English uh, instances running as well. Mm -hmm. What we test is uh, if the switching to other languages works, but for testing the languages themselves, we um, also have other approaches. It, I don't think it would be feasible to run all the tests on all locales. Uh, that would be overkill. <laughs> awesome. Um, I think we have a bunch of different questions. Um, folks, we will try to get these answered uh, maybe in a follow-up. Um, veteran will be sharing these with you. Um, but thank you so much for you know coming on board. Um, it was great to sort of see um, what you had to share, how you do things. Um, a lot of interest around these guys. Uh, you can tweet uh, Benjamin. Um, we'll be dropping his handle uh, and following up with those questions. Um, again, thank you, Benjamin. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate, appreciate it. Thanks for having me and have a nice conference the rest of it. <laughs>